everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my sewing room. So today I have a little bit of a different examining an antique bodice video for you. I just purchased a bodice that was really intriguing me on eBay and because that's just like what I do and I'm obsessed with scrolling through Victorian bodices on eBay. But I really have decided that I want to only add ones to my collection that are really interesting in some way or another. So I saw this little lady on uh, on eBay and I was so intrigued by it because it has been added to over the years it's been costumized um, this collar here and this weird peplum that is here at the bottom are additions that are modern probably no older than the 1970s if not even more modern than that but the rest of the bodice at first, when I was looking online, it actually almost looked a little 1840s, except that the shoulder placement is wrong. But in seeing it in person, it's definitely, I'd say, dating to about 1902, 1903, though the inside bodice construction is very simple and looks almost older, but it's machine stitched, so it's definitely not 1840s. Um, so anyway, I thought that this was so interesting. I wanted to share it with you as is first and then what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to carefully remove the collar and the peplum and restore it back to some semblance of its original self. I'm probably going to leave this lace trim that they have added onto the sleeves in place just because I think it looks really nice. It's a vintage lace but I really don't think it's original to the bodice. I think this was probably added around the same time as this. Um, and I'm not sure that there was ever actually any trim at all. So the most mysterious thing to me about this bodice though, is that the silk feels weird. My first inclination actually was that it wasn't even silk. Now it's definitely not any sort of like a cotton blend or anything like that. My first inclination was actually that it was some sort of an acetate taffeta, but I have since dived into some research on the history of alternative forms of silk, of faux silk, and based on the bodice's age of being about 1902, 1903, I highly, highly doubt that it is an artificial silk, just because artificial silk at that point was for the most part pretty unstable. It wasn't really until the 19-teens that artificial silk became something that was used a little bit more and wouldn't dissolve when wet or something or some of them I think were even s flammable slash explosive. So I really don't think it's an artificial silk but it is a very thin sort of silk that is actually extremely sturdy feeling. That's what kind of made me think it was almost artificial or something like that. It's very very sturdy feeling but it's also very thin, very lightweight, very crisp. And, uh, and I know that silk can do this too, but it does leave definite, it has definite scars where there were previous lines of stitching. So I find that really interesting. Again, it just feels so sturdy. It's in amazing condition. I mean, almost flawless. There's literally, uh, there's like a few pin prick holes. There's a couple of spots on the back of the shoulder here. And one of the sleeves has like the tiniest, tiniest tear in the world. Um, so it's an amazing condition and I really want to remove these weird additions and uh, and restore it and I don't know it's still just so intriguing to me. Uh, I had a chat with one of my friends and we were almost thinking she had the idea that it was possibly an early 1900s ver like theatrical bodice of the 1840s um, because this bishop sleeve that's on here, this is very, very common in 1902-1903, which is why I really dated it to that. However, adding a sleeve to the top of the bishop sleeve is far less common, and to me it almost brings this to the look of an 1840s bodice, which is really interesting. Uh, that said, the shoulder seams are squarely where they should be for that early 1900s. If this was 1840s, it would drop off. But it's got the sort of like pouched look of the early 1900s, but with 
this sort of detail here that's the uh, additional like a little tab there it's almost feeling like it wants to be an 1840s fan front so and the uh, the inside construction again is very simple no boning no nothing like that so uh, it feels she, I mean we, she still might be right that this might be an early 1900s costume of the 1840s um, so that's why I want to dive in and get rid of this collar, get rid of this ugly peplum, and return it to its original self because this is just so intriguing to me. And I wish that I had a microscope or some way to do a fabric test that isn't a, a burn test, obviously, because I just want to know more about this fabric. So uh, anyway, let's get to it. As I'm doing so, I'm finding that there is a nicely finished edge here of the collar uh, that has been folded and turned down almost like some sort of a binding as opposed to a collar. I'm going to keep unpicking and I will come back to you later. All right, I have removed the collar that big stand-up collar, and this nicely bound edge looks just really nice and easy, so that's, uh, I like how they've constructed that, um, but it's very, very simple. So now the next bit is that I'm going to go ahead and remove the peplum, and then I will come back to you and we'll do our regular examining a bodice video, because this one has all sorts of interesting stuff, particularly piecing, that I can't wait to show you. Better get to work. It also has a bunch of snaps that I have to remove because everywhere where they've added new lace, etc., they have added snaps, which is, I suppose, useful if it's like a theatrical method. Um, and I'm just trying to be very careful with this. Again, luckily, this is the heartiest bodice, I think, of anything in my collection. It just feels so solid even though it's made of a very lightweight fabric it just feels very I don't know very safe like I'm not worried about it falling apart disintegrating anything like that honestly I just come across it this is the only hole in the entire bodice which is pretty amazing so uh, anyway back to picking I'm back. I have finished taking off both the collar and the peplum that had been added, and it's looking much more like a historical bodice now. <laughs> Look at that, instead of some weird costume. My best guess is still that this is a 1902 to 03 bodice, and that is due largely to the shape of this sleeve. This is a bishop sleeve. And I love uh, what they've actually, how they've made this sleeve because it is pieced like crazy. You can see this seam line right here. There's, this is the actual seam down the sleeve that goes all the way down. But it's had this piece pieced in here, which is a really weird shape too. Uh, because you can see it comes over into here, into the gathers. So it's a funky triangle put in there. And then we go to the other side of the sleeve, and there's another different funky triangle. So I just love what they've done there. So that makes this a four-piece sleeve, I believe, and I think it's actually different on the other one, too. This is the only damage in this entire bodice are these tiny little holes just here on the sleeve. So that is really fantastic. The whole rest of the bodice is in fantastic condition. And... Um, 
there is also it's come out of the gathering there. That doesn't necessarily look like something that maybe was worn. It almost looked like looks like it was stitched poorly in the first place and just missed the cuff. So, um, but we have a really nice sleeve here. And again, this is the bishop's shaped sleeve where you have it pouch out in the back like this. And the weird thing about it is this cap because in the various fashion plates and such that I've seen, I haven't seen any that have this little gathered sleeve cap over the top of it. Um, the interesting thing though is that this sleeve cap here is actually covering the fact that this part is not lined at all. This part does have a lining in it that is of the cotton, same cotton that's in the bodice, um, and it is a fitted lining. So right now when I have my hand in here, um, my fingers are running up against the lining pretty much just above the cuff, whereas this whole poof poofs out away from the lining. But that lining also goes up here. So you can see a nice use of the selvage all the way along the top here of the silk portion of the sleeve. And then we get into the cotton of the sleeve and the cotton is covered by this oversleeve even though it's not attached in any way. It's just over the oversleeve and has about a one and a half inch overlap, I'd say, of where it comes down over the silk of the bishop's sleeve. So um, I think that's really interesting. And just so that we look at, like we pieced, looked at the piecing of the sleeve on the other side, we have the piecing here, which looks very similar to the piecing on the outside of the other sleeve. But the piecing that was on the inside of this, the other sleeve isn't on the inside of this sleeve. So I guess they had enough fabric for that. Um, they, uh, they do, however, there's, so they, this fabric, it is incredibly scarred, or I don't know the best way to say that, but it, it's scarred in some way when they, probably when they were making it, anywhere that there was a stitch line is really, really obvious. So there's a lovely stitch line going all the way down this uh, sleeve here. And then you can see the actual stitch line, which is about half an inch over from where they had some row of stitching. Uh, not sure what that was from if that was like oh whoops that was a mistake I meant to make that a little wider because similarly speaking I think I showed it before but the stitches on the shoulder here this almost seems like the type of thing where you set your sleeve in and then you especially in a gathered area where everything's kind of hard to see you set your sleeve in and you realize that it did that little pinch where the sleeve got got caught up in the seam, you know what I'm talking about if you sew, because I'm sure it's happened to all of us and not just me. And then they had to undo it and then, oh, look at that. We're left with the scar that went right across the top of the sleeve head here. So um, I really appreciate those sorts of things because, you know, we all experience the same. You can see scarring here on the back as well. We've got a weird triangle that's like not quite the very center back because I'd say center back is uh, about right here where my finger is. So this is not quite the center back. It's just off center. We also have a tiny triangle right here. Again, not sure what those would have been from. Um, and then there's some other stitch lines that are slightly harder to see right here. And uh, I, I don't know, that could have been a trim. Any of these, I suppose, could have been trim. We don't have anything over here on the other shoulder, though. So... Um, and then there's also this line right here, which looks almost more like a pull line than a stitch line, but I think, I think they are stitches as well. So there was something going on right across the back here. Um, but the back in general is just very simple. We've just got a nice little, uh, I guess this is kind of a reverse or this kind of a dart here in the center back, just two darts that form a box pleat down at the bottom. Both neckline and hem are just turned up and bound with a little piece of the silk. The weird thing here though is that the lining was left raw. So I'm really not sure why that was because the lining, you can see the fray of the lining that's going past where the silk was turned up. So I don't know if that's because there was maybe a trim on there at one point or what. There is some uh, scarring here, but this could easily have been the lace at the at, that was at the peplum. And actually, come to think of it, this uh, scarring that's up here too, this could have been the collar. So um, 
I don't, you know, it, it's just a weird, it's kind of a weird bodice. Um, the construction is really interesting too, and I will go into that next. So since we're already looking at the back, one thing I wanted to note on the exterior construction here is that we have one large back piece here that does have that little uh, uh, dart into the box pleat. And then we do still have a side back piece here. Let's see if it'll stay. A side back piece right here that's got a nice little curved shape. And then our side seam is right here. Um, this is also, you can tell it's kind of gapping on my dress form. This is also a fairly decently sized bodice. I have not measured this yet, but it's larger than my dress form, which I believe has a 28 inch waist and it's larger by at least a couple inches. So uh, always nice to find those pieces that are a little larger. It's quite short waisted though, as I zoom out here. So you can see that it's barely hitting the waist of my dress form. It's really a little short. So now to look at the front construction. Uh, this front is pretty interesting here because uh, you can see it is built on a lining, but it's not flat lined to that lining. This is kind of a, a separate deal here. And I do wonder if there was maybe once padding inside the bust because there's this sort of remnant of padding. The remnant is only on this one side though. But when we look at the bodice construction, you have this nice sort of gathered area here to make that pouched out area that uh, they liked so much at the beginning of the 1900s. But then there's this pleat running down here, and this is actually hiding a seam. So you can see here, if it'll focus, there's a seam, there's a stitch line running there. But over on this side, you can see a, an actual seam for the next piece. So this over here is a separate piece than this over here. Um, and then this is just pleated up there and pressed flat. So this is all, I believe, this little flap is all actually part of the front bodice piece, the center front bodice piece. And then having this as the other part of the shoulder coming down and being a side front of the bodice since that seam runs all the way down the front. And then uh, again, we come to that side seam here underneath the arm. So looking at the interior here, we're starting to, you can see that this hooks up the front and the hooks are put way, way inside. So we wind up with this little lapping, uh, it's really, it's like an exterior facing and it's going up the center of the bodice all the way up. I don't have it hooked right now since I'm doing this one handed, but, uh, but those hooks are really far. I'd say more than halfway within this facing here that is done to the outside. And then we have our interior hooks. And so I love love how curved this is because I wind up having to curve all of my bodices quite a bit so it's always nice to see it in actuality as well and if you notice the curve is pretty low and I think that's kind of because this is that sort of pigeon breasted area so the bust line is lower in uh, in this era than we think of kind of as you know earlier in the Victorian as opposed to the Edwardian era and um, and then this has hooks and eyes going up the center and these hooks are quite interesting they look rather flat and hammered they don't look like our modern hooks they're quite smooth and so I just find that quite interesting it is missing a few it's missing one here one here and one here and then it's also missing a couple of eyes and there is actually this one has ripped out the eye ripped out of the bodice so unfortunately the bodice is the lining of the bodice is a little ripped there and this is just a cotton. I believe this is a polished cotton, though it's not very nicely polished, but it does have just a little bit of sheen there. Um, and this part is darted. So I'm going to take this over to the table now so that we can look at the interior together. I love the interior of this bodice. It's really quite simple. Now, if you remember when we looked at the back of the exterior, the entire 
center back was all cut in one piece. However, when we're looking at the lining here, you'll notice that it's actually made up of four pieces here. Uh, we have these nice little curved seams, and we do have our center back seam, all of which have been delightfully pinked, to use a, a I'm, I don't know if pinked is really the right term here, to be honest, because I think they've been individually cut. I don't feel like you get this nice sort of, what is that, a trapezoid shape um, with a pinking shears. I think this was cut separately. And, uh, and then finally our lining here does meet up with our exterior over here at the, at the side back seam. And then again, this part is flat lined. I suppose really this is the only piece that's the same on the exterior and the interior is this side back. Um, and everything has been nicely whipped down here on the seams. It's all been whipped to each other to finish the edge as opposed to whipping it down to the bodice itself. Likewise, up here at the shoulder seams, uh, they've just finished this off so it won't fray by whipping the raw edges. You can actually see the other half of that scarring from that weird dart there. And then the sleeve is lined with the uh, with a different type of cotton, with a different color of cotton. Uh, it's still a polished cotton, I believe, but it's a, a bit rougher. But that was what we saw on the exterior as well. And uh, the seam allowance of the arms eye has been whipped together too to prevent that from fraying as well. The front is just darted with two darts. And then we do have that nice curve. And what I love here is that where this has been folded back, we get these great pleats that they had to put in to match the curve because um, it's just a fold, it's not a facing. <laughs> Let's take a look at the measurements and see just what the size is. Actually, before I take a look at the measurements, I did want to point out one other fantastic bit of piecing, which is this right here. So normally, of course, if we're going to piece, we don't think about piecing directly in the center front of the bodice because it's pretty obvious. But uh, they wound up running out of length. You can see the selvage here. So they ran out of length, or I guess really they ran out of width because they're doing this actually, the width of the fabric being the length of the bodice. And uh, they needed to piece in a little bit extra. So we have this fun horizontal seam that's going across both sides of the center front of the bodice. And that was just what they did. So I am guessing that this was a kind of a home construction and they didn't have probably that much of this fabric. And so that's why we get so much piecing both in the sleeves, uh, especially, and then also in the center front of the bodice. But now that I've done up the hooks, let's take a look as best we can at the size. So unfortunately, most of the hooks and eyes that are missing are right at the waist. So I've put a tiny glass head pin in just the barest bit of the bodice that I can, uh, just so that I can get a measurement here. And the measurement really, it looks like it's at 16 and a quarter laid flat. So it means we're at 32 and a half inches for the waist. So not bad. I think there are a fair amount of modern people who have waist that size. Um, again, nice to see when there's a bodice that's a little larger. The bust may be a little harder to do just because the front is significantly larger than the back. So I think I'll actually open it back up and run a measuring tape around. Um, I will try to give you a bird's eye view while I do that. All right, so now that we have that open, we can go ahead and attempt to take a measurement of the bust. It's always harder since the bust is so curvy, but I'm going to just start the, the tape measure here. So we're at about 10 and three quarters to the center, uh, the side seam. And then from there to our center back, 
we've hit about 21 and a quarter. So uh, multiplying that by two, that gives us 42 and a half. So 32, what did I say? 32 and a half waist and 42 and a half bust. So not bad. Um, again, I think this is like even a decently near to average waist and bust measurement for modern day standards. So it could very well be that with the, um, with the shortness of the length of this bodice and then also those larger sizes, this could be very well be someone who was maybe just a little bit stout um, because it is so short-waisted. Uh, and again, you don't see as many that are the larger sizes, but that's normally because they were worn so much. It's not that people weren't larger back then, weren't as large as now. I mean, they were a little smaller, but um, but the, it's not like a lot of people think that there just were no larger people back then because you don't see a lot of bodices that are larger, but that's not the case at all. It's just that those bodices got worn a whole bunch of times. So to see one that is a little larger like this, and it is in such fantastic condition, and it clearly has been worn. You can see the pit stains over here. They got it on both sides. So, you know, they sweat a little bit. There's a little bit of a stain right here from something. And there were those spots on the back. Um, but actually, even the interior, you don't see too much of a pit stain. There's a little bit. But um, to really not have that bad of, of wear and uh, to be in such great condition as far as holes go, I think this was a really great find. And it really, taking off that weird collar and peplum, really brings back just how nice and lovely this bodice is it's a little simple but it's it's fun especially with these great bishop sleeves i think those are really just the standout point of this bodice look how wide that bishop is there by the time it gets to the bottom <laughs> be really quite wide um so nice to see and again because of these bishop sleeves i would date this to about 1902 or 1903 uh, if that said, if you have different guesses as to what you think this year is, please share. And especially if you have additional background to what, uh, what the fabric might be in case it's really not a silk. I think probably based on the year that it's probably a silk that I just haven't experienced before. And it's a silk that's in really great condition. If you have a good history of what faux silk might have been of the time, uh, please share. I've only read a couple of articles and I think it's pretty fascinating so far. So again, do please comment below. But um, overall, I'm happy to add this to my collection. So I did have a question that came up on my last Examining an Extant Bodice video that was to, if I could kind of help to go over who it might have been that would wear these bodices. And I love that question, I honestly do, but it's so, so hard to really know at all without any sort of paperwork or anything that comes with a bodice that says, oh, it was worn by this type of person at this time. Um, it's really hard to know anything more than maybe the most basic guess at a socioeconomic status. Uh, for example, this bodice being plainer, being definitely... Um, homemade, uh, though made on a machine, I would guess that this is someone who is probably lower middle class, but it's really, really hard to tell beyond that. And I just say that because it is fairly plain. Uh, the interior is very plain. It doesn't have like the boning put in nicely. So it's, it's a home sewer for sure. No labels or anything like that. Um, but it is all fully or almost fully sewn on a machine. Actually, the only signs that I could find of hand sewing are these were definitely hand gathered. In fact, I should have shown a close up of this because these are fantastic. These gathers. Hopefully it'll focus on that. Um, but I love these. They're very, very finely gathered. Come on, focus. Well, it's not quite focusing, but those are hand gathered there. Um, and you can actually see even some of the stitches because I think they, it's possible they might have even put the cuff on by hand. Um, and then also there are gathering stitches that can still be seen in the shoulder as well. This is just not focusing. Oh, 
tried to show you that, but uh, the focus is not working. So you can see the, the gathering stitch in the shoulder. They never actually took it out. Um, and you can see that that's a different thread and it's definitely done by hand. But everything else on this is all fully done by machine. Um, but again, pretty roughly done. So, and you can see the mistakes that there were mistakes made that had to be redone. So I would say a uh, home sewer, um, who maybe wasn't the best home sewer, but hey, they still made a pretty awesome bodice. The other thing that actually points to someone of potentially maybe even lower than lower middle class is the use of piecing, just how much this is pieced. And in places that are somewhat obvious, um, this could have been someone who maybe didn't have as much money or was maybe working with um, maybe even like scraps of fabric. So that's entirely possible too. But beyond that, there's really no way to tell. It's even hard to say, you know, where these people were from. Beyond looking at the location of where I ordered them from on eBay, there's no telling whether that person ordered it from someone else on eBay or where it was found. So it's just really hard to say any of the actual history of the people who might have worn these. So I do think that there is still the slight possibility that my friend might be right and that this could have been a theater costume based on the 1840s. But I think, honestly, it's probably just someone who was a rougher sewer um, and you know, was really, maybe she liked a couple different sleeve elements and she decided to put them together into one sleeve, which is cool. I love that idea. It's just that you don't see that cap very often in 1902, 1903. Uh, what you do see though, is sometimes you see the great bishop sleeve down here and you see a much longer cap that covers to about here on the bishop sleeve. So this could even have been uh, an idea of, oh, I want to do that. Oh, I don't have enough fabric. So you never know. And of course, the average person isn't going to dress exactly like a fashion plate. That's the other thing we have to remind ourselves, that fashion plates were their version of Vogue. And the majority of people do not dress like they stepped off the pages of Vogue. They dress like a person who bought their clothes in a store. So, or in this case, who made their clothes. So, you know, they could have those style ideas, but they're not going to necessarily look like that after they go through and make it themselves or buy it themselves or what have you. So I've totally digressed on the subject, but there's definitely, I think it's so interesting to think about who might have worn them, but there's no way to say really for sure without some sort of like certification of, oh yes, this was my mother's blouse. Here is a picture of her wearing it in 1902. Obviously not my mother in that case, but, um, and, you know, this has been handed down from the family and it always lived in this trunk and etc. At that point, great. And keep, keep that documentation with that bodice forever because then it has the story with it. But beyond that, there's no way to tell. So, um, I think, again, I think it was a great question. Thank you for, for commenting and, and asking that on the last video. Um, and please, if you have any other questions about this bodice, about any of the other antiques that I've shown, or just sort of antiques in general or style in general of any of the periods, please, please comment them below. I will do my best to answer them. Sometimes there's just not a good answer, but I will definitely do my best. And if I have to research and, you know, find out a little bit more, that's totally fine too. Cause I enjoyed even yesterday going down the history of acetate wormhole, uh, to learn a little bit more about what maybe this bodice could be made of. Speaking of which, uh, I highly, highly doubt that it's acetate because acetate, although it was patented in, I believe the 1890s, I was 1892, uh, it was only made, um, commercially available for commercial production in England in 1905 and in the U.S. in 1911. I will link where I've read all this below. Um, but because of that and because of the approximate age of 1902-1903 of this bodice, that's not the case. It's not going to be acetate. So, um, but I thought that was a great wormhole. And again, check out the article linked it below. It was really fascinating to read about faux silk. So um, if anyone else has it had experience with a bodice that maybe just doesn't quite feel silk. 
but is an antique, please let me know also because I would love to hear your stories. I'd also love to hear all about your collections. I love it when uh, when people comment that say, they say, oh, I just bought my first bodice and because I know that you're probably going to go down the same path that I am and get addicted to it because it's really fun to start this collection. Anyway, I've talked long enough. Thank you so much. If you made it to the end of this, congratulations. Uh, if you would like to see more videos like this, please also comment that below and please click the thumbs up icon to let me know that you enjoy this type of video. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a video definitely helps me out. In fact, I am getting close to, I may have even passed it by the time this video goes up, I'm getting close to a thousand subscribers, which is so amazing. Thank you all so much. I can't believe it. And uh, I think I am going to be running a little giveaway uh, because of that milestone. Editing Rebecca here. I hit a thousand subscribers. Thank you all so much. So yes, that giveaway is live over on my Instagram at Lady Rebecca Fashions. Go check out my post from Monday, June 15th, and you will be able to enter that giveaway, which will be open until noon Pacific time on Monday, June 22nd. Thanks again. So uh, please go check out there. And again, please subscribe here. And I will see you in my next video. Thank you so much and happy sewing.